I've also learned, for me, the most important thing in the fellowship is rigorous honesty. Rigorous honesty changed, did more to change my life than anything. Clergy are generally phony because we are not expected to be honest. We're expected to be good. And those are not exactly the same thing. In fact, they're exactly not the same thing. And in that little group where I experienced rigorous honesty among them and slowly for myself, and then in my support group where I said, ooh, I got to have a member of AA in this group or we're not going to ever be any good. That changed my life with my wife. We have rigorous honesty. Every so often we have to say, mm, rigorous honesty, here's what I want. It's life-giving. It is life-giving not to have to try to be what people expect. I heard it through the grapevine. Welcome. It's the AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour, featuring the collected voices of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm Don, an alcoholic in Greensboro, North Carolina. Hey, Don. Hey, everybody. I'm Sam, an alcoholic in Palm Springs, California. Hiya, Sam. Sam, can you think of something that your sponsor said to you early on that you've never forgot? I'll go first and give you a, a minute to think about it. But um, That's very kind of you. <laughs> well, let me see. I got two of them that really stuck with me. Oh, now don't go hogging the show now. Don't. I'm going to hog the show. One is my sponsor said early on, is, Don, there is a God and you're not it. That was like 18 years ago he said that to me. <laughs> uh, and I heard someone today who said that the same guy had said that to him. So he loved to say that. <laughs> so that's one. And another one that comes back to me all the time was my wife wanted to start contra dancing which is like square dancing so we were going to have to go learn to dance and I was like sober and I'm gonna go dance I don't know if I can do this and I was really like anxious about it and I kept talking to my sponsor about it and as I was driving the night of Friday night before the dance to go learn how to do it with this group of people I called him and I was going, okay, I'm going to do this thing. He said, well, okay, but Don, be careful. You might have fun. <laughs> <laughs> and you did. And I did. And that stays <laughs> with me anytime I'm concerned or anxious about something. If, particularly if it's fun, I yeah. might have fun. You don't know. I don't want to limit myself. You've mentioned that a few times, and I that stuck with me as well. I mean, it's part of that trying on new things. <laughs> what about you? One that stood out to me is honor everyone's path. It has really stuck with me all these years because there is no one right way to do this. Allow other people to have their path. Exactly. Yeah. You know, we asked for listeners to call in, and later today we're going to play. A listener called in with uh, something that his sponsor told him that has stuck with him. I wish that some more people would call in. Please do. Indeed, and you can find out how to call in at aagrapevine.org slash podcast. Who's our guest today? On today's guest is Ward Ewick. What? A last name? Yep. <laughs> We'll get to know him a bit, and then we'll dip into the Ask It Basket, which used to be Ask the Old Timer. And now a word from our sponsors. We don't have sponsors? What are you thinking? Oh, yeah, we don't do the commercial sponsor thing. Since the grapevine is self-supporting, we don't sell ad space in our magazine, on our website, or in our podcast. Grapevine doesn't even accept donations from AA members. If you want to support Grapevine and this podcast, visit aagrapevine.org slash store. Well, I am Ward Ewing. I've been involved with Alcoholics Anonymous since the mid-70s. I'm an ordained minister in the Episcopal Church. I had just taken a position in Louisville, Kentucky, in a small little church, small enough that I could see what was happening to families and talking to the young people and what was going on. In fact, I got my first call to go visit somebody at jail from his wife in the first years I was there. And I said, I've got alcoholism in this parish as if I hadn't had it before. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> Surprise. And, and, and Surprise. Yeah. And my eyes were open somehow. 
so I decided to go to the experts because I didn't know anything and I didn't know what to do and I needed some information and I started attending open AA meetings. Because you're not an alcoholic. Not Yeah, I only go to open meetings. So I started attending meetings and, and I did some work with the University of Louisville and education programs they had for alcoholism and clergy. And then in 1980, a member of my parish walked into my office. His name's Willie. He said, you're the spiritual expert, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I didn't answer that. <laughs> like, that's, a no, no better than that. that's a loaded question. <laughs> He said, I'm out of touch with God. And the last time I was out of touch with my higher power, I drank. If I drink again, I may die. I need you to put me back in touch with God. Mm. And I also knew I couldn't do that. But we talked and decided that what we needed was a group of members of AA who had at least five years sobriety. So they've got a little experience behind them who want to talk about the spiritual aspect of the program and of their lives. So every Tuesday afternoon for the next five years, I met with this group. I mean, it's not an AA group. It was just members of AA. You can imagine who was really changed by that group. That was the Uh beginning of my whole process of working the steps. I always considered Willie my first sponsor. It changed my life. It changed my ministry. It changed my my relationship with my wife and my children. Uh, You know the steps. You know what they do for you. And I've been working them as my primary spiritual program ever since. And this led to a, a long experience with AA. Yeah, I continued at two different levels, I guess. I continue to go to open meetings and I still go to open meetings. I have a little, I'm way, today I'm retired and live out in East Tennessee in the country. We only had one group in the whole county. Met Sunday night, it was closed. Some members of that came to me and said, can you help us get another group started? And so we work and put together another group, meet Saturday morning and it's open. And I, I don't go every week. I think that's inappropriate, but I go at least once a month. I want to interrupt just a moment to make the distinction between an open and closed meeting for someone who's listening who might not know what that is, which is that a closed meeting is for alcoholics only for anyone who has a desire to stop drinking. And an open meeting is for anyone interested in Alcoholics Anonymous or alcoholics. Right. So I've continued for my own spiritual health to be in touch and to work with people. But I also continued in terms of the need to educate folks about this disease. And so in the church, we would hold a five-week session about every three years. Always ended up with some people saying, you know, I've got a problem. I need Hmm. to do something about it. I did education programs in the diocese. So I was at two levels, it, my own spiritual growth, by continuing to stay in touch with the meeting. One of the things that's important, I think, for anybody, certainly for clergy who are running an organization, is to have a support group. And I discovered early on, I put together this support group. They were all clergy. And it was phony. It was a waste of time. And I realized, I know how to fix this group. So I found another priest who I knew was in the program and asked him to be a part of the group. And it changed immediately. You know, well, not, well, what was different? Oh, you have a great psyche to avoid BS. <laughs> and it just changed. That was the end of the group that just sat around and talked about the weather and stuff. <laughs> From that time on, I've always had a member of this fellowship in my support groups. Uh, so in 98, I was elected dean and president of General Theological Seminary in New York City. And again, we began the first course in the Episcopal Church for clergy on alcoholism and, and the role of clergy. That was rated every year on the student evaluations as the most important and helpful course they had. After I got sober, I joined the Unitarian Universalist Church. After that, I moved to a Quaker church. Right. And I've always made it a point to go and talk to the minister and let the new minister know that I'm an alcoholic. And if anybody has a problem with alcohol, I'm available. Please contact me. Have you had success with that? Uh, Some? I had with one, and I had uh, one minister who's like, she didn't really think that Alcoholics Anonymous was that great. There's a real resistance there. I don't know where it was coming from. I don't either. And I tell members of the fellowship, if you'll go and talk to your clergy, let them know, you'll know in three minutes whether they're going to be responsive and use you and and be helpful to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Whenever I would get an emergency call, a wife called me, her husband had just gotten his third DWI. She knew he's going to lose his license. They lived in the suburbs. She didn't know how she, he was going to get to work. She didn't know. It, crisis. Mm-hmm. So I call a friend of mine in AA and we go out. I can't, I can't deal with him. I don't have a story that he can relate to. Mm-hmm. 
And that's where, where the hope happens. That's where the connection happens. So I take a friend of mine and I talked with her and that she needed to be in Al-Anon and they both ended up in the program and it changed their lives. Wow. So it's really helpful when members of AA will let their clergy, their doctors, their lawyers, anybody else that they're connected to professionally know about their, that does not break anonymity. Anonymity is the level right. of press, radio, and, and podcast. And podcast. Correct. <laughs> at, that, at that public level, we are anonymous, but we're not anonymous within our communities. No. And it, I, I got a dentist who was interested, but my, my doctor said, uh, well, I don't know. And I never heard a word from him. It just really varies. But every once in a while, every once in a while, that connection happens and it'll save lives when it does. So you said that people came to you wanting to find God. How do you help someone with that? Well, I've learned a lot <laughs> since 1975, 1980. Oh, <laughs> let, me, let me back up just a little bit. Uh, while I was in New York, I, began, I met a couple of members who were trustees of the fellowship, and it was they who put my name in to be a trustee. Mm -hmm. And I was elected a trustee in 03, and then I was elected chair of the board in 09, and I rotate out of that in 2013. And since that time, I've been a trustee emeritus, which means... And that's a class A trustee, right? Class A, class A trustee, non-alcoholic. That means amateur, right? That means amateur, absolutely. <laughs> okay, not boozer, which is class Correct. B. Okay. Correct. You've got the service structure down. <laughs> so one of the questions early on was, how can you relate that you're an ordained minister who has a theology and AA, which has God as we understand him or higher power? Mm -hmm. And I guess the first lengthy address that I ever gave to the trustees, and it was on, there's only one criteria for membership, and that's the desire to stop drinking. And belief in God is not listed in that. Some will believe, some won't. Actually, I was known through the fellowship as the minister who didn't think we should have the Lord's Prayer at AA meetings. That's not entirely true. I think we should not have the Lord's Prayer at open AA meetings. And why is that? Because people who come in rarely have great relationship with God. Yeah. And many have been damaged by the church and by self-righteous souls who think they're doing good. All I've heard stories about people who came in, were turned off by the God talk, didn't stay with AA, but came back. My concern is those stories we know, but how about the stories of people who came to AA, didn't like the God talk, left, and never came back and died? Yeah. To me, that's just a huge concern. Where have I come down finally on all of this? It's mm -hmm. about experience. It's not about theology. Every member I've ever met in AA has experienced the fact that they couldn't stop the drinking on their own by their own determination. But there was something, a person, a group, a power, a, something that enabled them to be able to stop. And it's a bit of a mystery. And I'm willing to leave it at a mystery. To me, that's what's important. If you want to call that God, fine. If you don't want to call that God, fine. I was one of the speakers for the first international AA for atheists and agnostics and free thinkers. It was wonderful. And I continue to be in touch with folks in that group because they teach me a, a great deal. M much of which they teach me is humility. We in the church don't have answers. We think we do. We think everybody should agree with us. That's some of your BS. Um, <laughs> what we have is an experience. I have personal experience. You have some personal experience. It's something helped you do what you could not do on your own. That's something some of us are happy to call God. Others are not. The explanation is not as important as the experience. The explanation is not as important as the experience. That I love that. Okay. Uh, it does lead me to want to make a change in the steps. And that, of yeah. course, is heresy of the highest order. <laughs> I like to think of God of our experience, not God of our understanding, because I think none of us understand God. But we can, there are experiences that change our lives. And so the higher power is really the God of our experience. Yes. I've often thought that it should read, um, made a decision okay. to turn our will and our lives over the care of God as we understood him. I've, all, I've always thought it should say as we understand him, just because <laughs> it's like right. right now, whatever. Next week, I may have a different. 
I mean, one of the things that I've, I've shared for years now is that I am an atheist. I, I do not subscribe to any religion or, or theist idea, but I have had spiritual experience. Right. And in that, I have lost the need to define whatever it is. And that rolls right into what you're saying, the God of our experience. You might even tolerate the God of you, huh? <laughs> oh, I, I, so I learned from Don a long time ago. Don gave a talk where God was a problem. The word God for me was a problem when I came into these rooms. Right. And he was sharing about how it was for him too. And I learned from that talk to use the word God as shorthand for whatever this is. Right. And that's how that works for me. I have no problem with the word God today. Right. I transferred the meaning of the word God from what I grew up thinking it was, right. what I culturally have heard that it is, and instead have transferred it to the real thing that happened to me when I got sober and found that I could stay sober by asking the nothing <laughs> for help, and help arrived. And so something real happened to me that I was not pretending to believe because it really happened to me. So I assigned the word God to that. Yeah, I, I think that's all we any of us can do. I think to try to go beyond that. Theologians, I ran a theological school. <laughs> I had to <laughs> honor theology. But you look through the history of theology and, and you look through the descriptions and so on. It's, we really need a lot more humility about that. There you go. Ward... <laughs> Have you ever heard of the Ask It Basket? Sure. We did Ask It Basket at every forum that I attended as chair of the board, and I attended every forum across the country. Were you nervous when you dipped your hand in that basket? <laughs> Only the first time. <laughs> <laughs> After that, I said, these are loving people who have real concerns, and they're not going to beat on you for whatever you say. And they're not trying to trip you up. They're not trying to trip me up. <laughs> and when I realized, realized this was not an exam, this was legitimate questions coming from people who have legitimate concerns, it all changed. Well, with that attitude, it's time for the Ask It Basket. What's that? That's the name Bill W. gave the basket that was passed around for questions at conventions. We want your questions for our guests. General recovery questions, newcomer questions, AA history. Basically, it's our AA AMA. AA, ask me anything. Got a question for the Ask It Basket? Call in and record it at 212-870-3418 or email it to podcast at aagrapevine.org. You can find these and more at aagrapevine.org slash podcast. And now let's dip into the basket. Hey, it's Pete R., alcoholic. The alcoholic addict thing, is there a purity principle? Should you be in an NA meeting? I'm sure you tackled it, but my sponsor's old school, 14 years, and he's one of those. Alcoholic addict, we're here for Alcoholics Anonymous. It's hard to stop drinking. Go to an NA meeting. Um, but then, yeah, what would the master do in third tradition and don't turn anyone away and the what is it, the story of the 1941-year-old woman who was in the womanly way, I think pregnant, and they turned her away, the gentleman of Alcoholics Anonymous, as they say, and she later drank herself to death, her and the baby, two lives lost due to obstinence, you know. The heroin addict, I think, wasn't turned away, right, early on, but then there was no NA, so that's at the old-timer thing. I would like to hear that kind of thought out. Okay. This is not a new issue. Mm -hmm. And I think it's evolving. But l let me say, I'm in that kind of old school. I've been with this program a long time. And I think alcoholics need AA and addicts need NA. And my reasoning in that is what I already mentioned about why I would get somebody, if I had a crisis to go intervene in, I get someone from the fellowship to go. Because when you share your stories, if you can connect at that level, as, as a friend of mine often says, when I hear my story, on someone else's lips, and they are happy, joyous, and free, I have hope that maybe I can be that way too. And that, that connection at the story level, because at the story is where we share this, our spirit, the spirit of AA, and it's shared with somebody who needs to hear that. I can talk about it, but I'm always in my head. I don't have the story that is heart to heart. It's not a language of the heart. My language is a language of the head. And I think there's some truth of that about addicts and alcoholics. If an alcoholic 
had somebody come to him and tell their story of addiction to opioids, I don't think it would have any effect at all. In the same way, if the person with addiction hears somebody who's talking about drinking and hiding bottles and DWIs and, and bosses, and I don't think they connect to that story either. So I think there's a real reason in terms of the healing that can come to people for alcoholics to deal with alcoholics and addicts to deal with addicts. However, of course, there's a however. Uh, however, <laughs> so many today are dual addicted, and I'm not sure how they respond at a story level. If the dual addicted person gets an alcoholic story, there's some connection, clearly, because they do come into the fellowship. But at the local level, where the real power and direction of AA is determined, I think a lot of different kinds of things are happening. Some groups are, are openly open to addicts and alcoholics. I think most are still AA or NA, but some are open to both. I think some things are evolving. And as more and more people are dual addicted, I don't know what's going to come, but I, I trust the fellowship because that's how AA is formed in the first place. The steps are the steps because they worked. Here's what we did to get sober. Maybe you'd like to try. They're not commands. They're not laws. They're not doctrine. They're what we did that worked. And I think that's the same principle we have to have here. But let me tell you a little story about the little group that I go to. I helped found a group here in, in Meigs County, and I go occasionally. One Saturday morning, I was there, and in walked a middle-aged woman with her teenage daughter. She announced that her daughter was an addict and she needed help. And that's why they came to this group. And I thought, oh, wow, I can't imagine worse. Here's a woman who desperately needs Al-Anon and a daughter who desperately needs NA. And here they are. What is going to happen? And I watched our group and it was wonderful. They very kindly talked with her about Al-Anon and about not trying to run your daughter's life, that she has to make the decisions. And gave her a list of Al-Anon meetings nearby, and they talked with the daughter, and they shared some of their story in doing so, and said, I'm not sure this connects to you. I don't know that this is your experience. And the place you'll find your experience is in NA, and they gave her some meetings to go to. And I understand they went. The next week, this, one of the members of our little group said, I think she went to the NA. I don't know if the mother went to Al-Anon. I'd be surprised because she's really controlling. Uh, <laughs> but but I, think, I, I think where we are right now on this question is not about how the group should be or whether we should have people who get up and say, I'm an, I'm an alcoholic and an addict, but rather how do we deal with it in a compassionate and loving way to help them find the right place. And I think that's where we really are today. And out of that may evolve some new practices and some new kinds of groups. But right now, we just need to help each other find the right place. Ward, that's a beautiful response to that. I, I agree. My experience is one year sober, I was chairing a beginner's meeting and I closed up the meeting. So I was the only person left there at the end. This one guy was helping me who was brand new. And I was talking to him about not drinking and all. And at the very end, as we were locking up, he said, but I'll tell you the truth. It's not alcohol I really have a problem with. I want to go out of here and I'm going to get some crack and I think I'm going to do it. And all I could say to him was, don't do that. Right. <laughs> I I, because I don't have any experience with crack. Right. I couldn't speak to him in a way that he could feel in his heart, the language of the heart. Right. And I realized he was at the wrong meeting. He should have been at an NA meeting. And then someone there would have been able to say, I know exactly how you feel. I've been there. And here's what I did. But whatever the case, dealing with it, it's beautiful to be able to do it with compassion and then direct them to where they can get help. Right. Right. Ward, Don's heard this hundreds of times. But I'm going to go nutshell real quick. Um, my last drink was in 2003. But in 2012, I reset my sobriety date because I used poppers and diet pills in a way that's not sober for me. That awareness came about from meeting some people in Crystal Meth Anonymous. Mm -hmm. And I became a member of Crystal Meth Anonymous during that time while remaining a member of Alcoholics Anonymous too. CMA in North Carolina was very small. There were only two meetings a week 
you know, there's that recommendation that we do 90 meetings in 90 days, no matter what the <laughs> fellowship is. CMA uses AA's first 164 pages as their program. So it was recommended that CMA members go to AA meetings as well. So they really meshed beautifully. But then fast forward to 2020, and I move out here to California, where Crystal Meth Anonymous is a very large fellowship. And I tried going to some meetings here, but what happened is I have no experience at all with meth. And I cannot relate to their experience. Right. And it shows up. And that further cements my understanding and support of our primary purpose. Because yeah. alcohol is what drove me down so very hard to the point of trying to kill myself. Alcohol is what I could not shake at all. And I needed to hear other alcoholics sharing their experience about that. And that's exactly why I always have to get somebody from this fellowship. And I've been called about a crisis that is a potential intervention because I don't have a story that can connect with them. We need one of you to go with me. Ward, thanks for joining us today. And stick with us because we want to play some listener feedback calls that we got. But folks, we'd like to hear your thoughts and experience. Email podcast at aagrapevine.org or Call in like Peter did. And speaking of calls. Hey, Sam, can you get that? It's the listener feedback phone. Uh, 212-870-3418. Yeah, hang on. I'll get it. Hello? Peter R., alcoholic, Long Island, New York. I just love the podcast. It's really phenomenal. Uh, I love the banter, the back and forth. I love the love of alcoholics. <laughs> it's unique and powerful. It means a lot to me. It means the world. Thank you so much. God bless. Thanks for calling and participating, Peter. Thanks for your kind words and the ask it basket question earlier. And all the great jokes that you sent us, they're going to be coming up soon. Peter's prolific, isn't he? <laughs> he is. <laughs> it's great. Now we have a call from Jerry. Hi, folks. My name is Jerry. I'm an alcoholic. I'm in British Columbia, Canada. Just been listening to your podcast. What a great job. You had offered uh, for us to call in and offer things we heard from our sponsor. And I wanted to pass on what LMAC in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, told me many years ago when I first got sober and became involved in service work. Al was from Mount Economy, Nova Scotia, a big barrel-chested man. He had this beautiful, deep voice. And he said, Jerry... Service work will improve the quality of your sobriety. It won't be pretty to watch sometimes, but it will. And all these many years later, all I can say is I've repeated that story so many times is he was right on both counts. Keep up the great work, folks. Thanks, Jerry. What an accent. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, thank you so much for that question. I, I got to tell you, my experience has shown that to be true. It has absolutely improved the quality of my sobriety, and it ain't pretty sometimes. My character defects have shown up. I have felt inconvenienced. This whole thing of working with people, give me a break. That's tough stuff. Then I've got this whole ego thing that I've got to deal with, and my impatience that's a really big character defect. That one shows up really well. And don't forget this whole idea that I'm right and whatever you're saying might have some value to it, but I'm still right. These are things that are not nearly as bad as they used to be. <laughs> um, and that's because I got a chance to practice a lot working with people in general service that we often do out the quote unquote real world. Yeah. But the cool thing is in doing it in general service, I get to do it with a group of people who are loving. And we all know that we're in this because we support Alcoholics Anonymous and we want it to thrive. And in doing that, we give each other the latitude and patience and room to grow. And it has been a really beautiful experience that I've gotten to help other people grow and I've got to experience my own growth. Ward, you've got quite a bit of experience with general service. You got any thoughts on this? Oh, I think he's so absolutely right. It's about life. There are three things we all seek answers to. We never get absolute complete answers, but they are, who are we? Where do we belong? And what are we for? What's the purpose in our life? And service is, whether it's making coffee or being a trustee, 
being on grapevine. Service fills one of those parts of who I need to be as a human being. One of the things I often talk about when I'm talking about groups is we listen a lot. You think of AA, you think about a speaker, but you don't think about the 30 people that are listening. And if you're in a discussion group, everybody's listening. We don't cross talk. Listening is hard work. And to learn to listen, that alone will make a change in your life. It certainly has in mind. And I appreciate your list, Sam. That's fabulous. <laughs> because we get impatient in con control issues. Don't even ask me about oh, I don't um, have control issues. <laughs> no. Well, I appreciate you, Ward, and I appreciate you being here. And I appreciate you pointing out that we wouldn't be here if it weren't for our listeners. <laughs> that's true <laughs> absolutely <laughs> folks we'd love to hear from you call in like peter and jerry did 212-870-3418 or email podcast at aagrapevine.org and you can like type up an email to us or you can record a voice file and send it to us there ward thanks for joining us well this has been great fun i've enjoyed it very much ward thank you the grapevine is looking for your story submissions Midlife Sobriety. Stories are due April 15th, 2023. Share about some of the challenges you've had after 8, 10, 20 years sober. Have you ever nearly relapsed? Did you ever stop going to meetings or disconnect from AA? Have you ever been a dry drunk? How did you get back on track? What helped you may help someone else. Share your story by April 15, 2023 via aagrapevine.org slash share. Peter R., alcoholic, Long Island, New York. I have a joke, and it goes like this. A drunk walks into a bar. I hear it's $100 all you can drink. That's right. Then I'll take $200 worth. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not that funny. Thanks for joining us. The AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour is posted every Monday and is produced by AA Grapevine, Inc. We don't speak for AA as a whole. We share the experience, strength, and hope of members to help others recover from alcoholism. Podcast info, including how to call in, is at aagrapevine.org slash podcast. Find AA Grapevine on Instagram and the AA Grapevine channel on YouTube. All things Grapevine are available at aagrapevine.org. If you want to know more about AA, Google Alcoholics Anonymous and your city or visit aa.org.